and a very warm welcome to you all in this virtual right circle session right circle is an initiative of prabha ketan foundation to promote english literature and is presented by shri cement when we are today on the brink of social recession an epidemic of loneliness and isolation we need to find a connection when we are not in the same physical space and these virtual creative sessions have come at a time when we needed them the most it gives me immense pleasure to welcome the well intellectual articulate and forthright mr jairam ramesh indian economist and politician from indian national congress defying the conventional image of a politician he is one of the erudite and eloquent people in the political circle and comes with a formidable resume a mechanical engineering graduate from iit mumbai and an alumnus of mit the congress politician in his variegated career has performed multiple roles he is currently the member of parliament rajya sabha representing karnataka state previously he has been entrusted with leading the ministries for rural development drinking water and development and sanitation and environment and forest among other prominent roles besides this is his capacity as an economist and policy expert he was the advisor to the prime minister and the finance minister on several issues he also served in the planning commission of india ministry of industry and advisory board on energy cabinet secretariat he has worked in journalism and has been a columnist for business standard business today the telegraph times of india and india today he has authored acclaimed books including making sense of chindia reflections on china and india to the brink and back india's 1991 story intertwined lives pn haksar and indira gandhi a few amongst many in conversation with him we have dr vikas balia a lawyer and rank holding chartered accountant with a passion for sustainable living ideas and a wide exposure to several areas of law finance management and policy making he has undertaken projects of lasting value at the forefront of which is kitabo country's largest children's literature festival over to you dr balia uh, thank you shailja welcome uh, mr gadam rubey you know what shailja was saying if i were to sum up in one word for you uh, ladies and gentlemen that word would be polymath i mean the the diverse backgrounds uh, that he has the academic background of technology and not just any 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 background it's the background of the highest order known mostly as politician and economist uh, but interestingly his works as an author are mostly either on environment or as a political historian um so let me uh, ask you who is jairam ramesh and what makes jairam ramesh what he is a uh, uh, technologist uh, a politician and economist of course we think of but more importantly as a political historian thinker philosopher and uh, an author none of the above because <laughs> uh, i am just a student of indian political and economic history uh, i've been extraordinarily lucky uh, to occupy Uh, positions uh, which have given me an opportunity uh, to contribute something to society but more importantly to learn uh, about the evolution of indian politics and of indian history so i am a lifelong student um, you're right i have multiple interests um, and i try to take interest in different disciplines uh, and uh, i try to learn i know i try to learn from people i try to learn from events uh and i think life is an ongoing learning experience and uh, i have been in public life uh, and i've been extraordinarily lucky that this public life has given me an opportunity for private education uh, that's all i can say 
lovely, you know, this is humility writ large. And you know, if you had uh, stopped at uh, none of the above, you know, I'm trained as a lawyer, I would have cross-examined and shredded that to pieces, that answer. <laughs> Uh, it's definitely all of the above and not none of the above. And, and to just to give perspective of, of uh, you also looked at things philosophically and, and in Green Sickness, uh, your book, you, had, you draw a parable with, um, with the metaphor of Isaiah Berlin, the fox and the hedgehog. So obviously you are in the category of the fox, uh, but how do you see yourself and how do you see the current polity? Are they mostly full of hedgehogs or we have a lot of foxes and, and, and you are not the lone uh, uh, sort of uh, battler there? Well, because, you know, uh, I'm not ideological, but I'm in the world of ideas. Uh, I don't want to be a prisoner of dogma. I don't want to be a prisoner of any ideology, but I want to grapple with ideas. I want to understand ideas, even if those ideas are something that are uh, not uh, favorable to my way of thinking. Uh, so I, for me, uh, it's important to understand the power of ideas. Uh, and that's what I've always tried to do, whether it's economic ideas, whether it's political ideas, uh, whether it is social ideas. Uh, you know, I, I, I always say that I'm in a marketplace of ideas. Uh, and I think the conversion of ideas into reality, the conversion of ideas into actions, uh, is really uh, what uh, animates me. You mentioned green signals. Uh, in 2009, I became environment minister. I'm not an environmentalist by any stretch of imagination. I had never been an environmentalist. I had never expected or even dreamt of being environment minister. But I must say that uh, the last 11 years, my whole life has been overturned after that experience as environment minister, because I realized, uh, you know, the limits of economic growth. I realized uh, that there are issues that go beyond a single-minded pursuit of economic growth, and that ecological balance, environmental sustainability, uh, equally important uh, as bringing investment uh, and building modern industry. So I think the life, if you were to ask me what's a one life transformative moment for me, it was when I became environment minister. Uh, and today, uh, I, I have to say, uh, wherever I go, people still remember me as environment minister, although I ceased being environment minister almost 11 years ago. Uh, that became a passion and that has remained so over the last decade because... Yes, and that speaks volumes and, and also the grand realization that you're open to ideas that you yourself do not uh, uh, maybe agree with, which is the hallmark of a liberal democracy. And, and talking of uh, liberal democracy, uh, we find that across the world it's on decline as how we've seen liberal democracy in the last few decades. Also from 2001 and 2009 episodes of 9-11 and the and economic Worse in the sense of uh, a citizen being absolutely opaque and the state to be transparent to a stage where we've come in where the state has become opaque and the citizen has become transparent. What with uh, even with the current pandemic, we have Arukya Setu and its, and its consequences. But how does that loss of liberal democracy, uh, if I can say so, uh, see uh, 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 looks to you as a philosopher as an, and an economist? Well, a liberal democracy everywhere, liberal values everywhere are under retreat and they are under assault because, and India is no exception. Uh, over the last couple of years, uh, values of liberal thought, uh, openness to ideas, uh, an ability to listen uh, has dwindled. Uh, and you all have, you all, all you have to do is to see the way our parliament functions. In parliament, people talk. Uh, they don't listen. They don't hear. And democracy is also about, you know, democracy is not just the freedom of speech. Uh, democracy is also the responsibility to listen and to hear. Uh, and, you know, one simple rule I have always followed, uh, you know, wherever I have been minister, whether it's commerce, power, environment, rural development, I've always had an open glass door, 
you know, uh, in my in my office. Uh, and that was a signal that was not just, you know, uh, sort of a off chance thing I did. It was to send a signal of transparency. Uh, and whatever I wrote as a minister on file, I would upload onto our ministry's website immediately. And I would get criticized. Uh, you know, people would uh, praise me, people would criticize me. But that's, you know, part of the game. So I think you have to practice what you preach. You have to practice openness. You have to practice transparency. Uh, and, uh, you know, you have, you really, uh, you can't take the public for granted. And I think um, you have, you or people in power, people in positions of responsibility and authority have a, res have a duty uh, to put information into the public domain. I was singularly fortunate uh, in uh, being involved in the process of uh, creating the Right to Information Act, uh, you know, in 2005, the RTI. You know, success has many fathers, failure is <laughs> often. Yes. So many people, uh, including uh, Arvind Kejriwal, who claim credit for the RTI. But yeah. I was one of the first, uh, you know, to start working on the RTI. Uh, so that's, you know, uh, that, that's real. But... You see, the point that you raise is very important. Liberal values are under threat. Uh, you can have your political opinion, you know, you can have your ideological viewpoint, but if I'm not going to listen to you, if I'm not going to engage you, if I'm not going to understand where you're coming from, and if you're not going to give me that same treatment, democracy breaks down, you know. Democracy is not the rule of the majority all the time, you know. Democracy means listening to the last man as well. And we are seeing today the horrible plight and distress of the migrants uh, in our society. And that reflects very poorly on all of us collectively, not any one individual or any one political party or one uh, government, but all, all of us collectively. I think that's precisely the reason uh, that, you know, as um, the criticism that you always found from within and outside, your ability to listen and acknowledging that uh, freedom is equal parts responsibility is what sort of gave you the tagline of the most autonomous body or an autonomous voice in any political party that you see today. And you you know, I, I, I must tell you, <clears throat> I go to parliament when parliament meets, I religiously go at 1030 and I don't leave uh, till I, uh, you know, till the parliament is over. And there are days in which I don't speak. And my colleagues come to me and says, Ya kya kar rahe ho? Aap bethe bethe thakte ho nahi ho? So bethe rehte ho? So then I tell them, Bethna bhi democracy hai. MP, MP hona sirf bhaashan dene ke liye nahi hai. MP bane hai sunne ke liye bhi. And this I found in the last 15 years, the ability to listen has completely vanished. But everybody wants to speak. Also, maybe most people don't realize, which I, I, I'm sure after, you know, uh, reading your works that, that you always believe in, that sometimes silence is the most powerful voice. Absolutely. You, you know, strategic silence, very, very important. The ability to know when to speak, how to speak, what to speak. And I think silence is a form of speech as well. Uh, and nothing illustrates that. Uh, that, you know, parliament is a wonderful learning experience in this regard. <laughs> you know, you don't always have to speak. You can say many things just by being silent, by your body language, by your eye expressions, by your hand expressions. <laughs> so you're absolutely right. But, you know, to come back to the basic point that you made, India is a liberal democracy. Yes. We are a diverse society. We are a multi-religious society a multilinguistic society, a multi-regional society, a multi-ethnic society. There is no country in the world which has the type of diversity that India has. And to me, my whole life uh, is engagement with diversity. How do you manage this diversity is the single biggest challenge before every Indian. And you know, your, uh, a lot of times your stance look counterintuitive and, 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 and just to get to that, let me just sort of introduce to the, uh, uh, to the audience one small trivia. Um, 
you know, we lawyers were always in for trivia. We like, uh, we like that. So, you know, last year at a book festival in Kochi, uh, Mr. Ramesh expounded his environmental reasons for promoting vegetarianism to packed audiences, as usual. And, uh, but you know, very few politicians possess the intellectual bandwidth and the pitless courage to be able to sell an idea as convincingly of vegetarianism to a dominantly beef eating audience. Now, there's a slight irony in it, and, but, but it takes, as I, as I was uh, uh, mentioning, pitless courage to be able to go out as a leader and talk counterintuitively to your own people. Uh, how do you do that? Where do you find the courage? And, and uh, what makes you take this counterintuitive stance and not just go with the flow? No, uh, I think, you know, if you have the courage of your conviction, if your conscience is clear, uh, if you're not indulging in any hypocrisy, then I think this is, uh, this is not difficult. Uh, I have always believed, and I think it's a good philosophy, mean what you say and say what you mean. There should not be any divergence or dichotomy between the two. You must mean what you say and you must say what you mean. Now, I know in politics, there is a little hypocrisy. This is what people say. There is a little hypocrisy. There is a little hypocrisy. You know, sida sida, gold mold ki baate. I think, okay, now, there is a place for that. But where on issues that count, on, in, on issues that you genuinely, passionately believe in, I think uh, you must have the courage to speak out and you must have the courage to take a lot of crap because there's a lot of crap that gets thrown at you, you know? Uh, and I, I, for example, when I was environment minister, because uh, there were decisions I took which environmentalists were not happy. And there were decisions I took, my own prime minister, my own finance minister was not happy. So I ended up, I would say, dissatisfying everybody. So my philosophy in life is, if you achieve balanced dissatisfaction, if you have managed to make everybody unhappy, then you're doing something right. You know, when in 2013, a new land acquisition law was being passed. Uh, and, you know, I spent a lot of time on drafting. You are a lawyer, you will know about the new land acquisition law. So somebody asked me in parliament, after the law was passed, how do you feel? So I said, look, Fiki is unhappy and CII is unhappy on the one side. And the second, Medha Patkar is unhappy, Aruna Roy is unhappy on the other side. So if both sides are unhappy, I must have done something right. So, you know, in life, you can never, you can never please everybody. But if you displease everybody, then I think you are doing something right with us. Absolutely. And I think that's such a rare, again, a rare commodity that you want to find because everybody wants to be politically correct and be on the right side of everyone. Uh, leave alone being on the wrong side of everyone. And um, uh, with that, just to take that counterintuitive thing uh, forward, you know, I was, I was a uh, long time back, I was going through one of your speeches in the parliament on the, on, on the languages. And it was such an eye opener when you read the numbers and the text of how the entire narrative is a completely different thing that's been done. And I'm talking, referring to Sanskrit and how this is, uh, being branded as the only classical language and all the funds, all the, all the budget for the languages is going to Sanskrit. And, and a narrative is created that uh, it's a revival of a great heritage. But nobody is willing to point out that the emperor might be wearing no clothes and it's not just the intelligent clothes. And, um, and uh, you need to see the other classical languages also, which is Tamil, Kannad, and, and a few others. And just how differential treatment is going in, and if a period of fifty years, the differential treatment of resource resource allocation goes in, it could just turn the tables away from a natural uh, growth, a Darwinian natural growth. So, how do you take that on, and how do you see? Because that Sanskrit is something which which just didn't come in the public domain discussion. Well, you know, I enjoyed that. First of all, I spoke in Sanskrit 
uh, for, a, for quite a long time, which uh, surprised most people, particularly my friends in the BJP, who think that they have a monopoly on Sanskrit, although they can't speak any Sanskrit. Uh, Mr. Pokhriyal was reading from a speech in Sanskrit. I was speaking, you know, ex tempo. So I know Sanskrit and I'm, uh, I'm aware of the value of Sanskrit. But my point was because, um, you know, Sanskrit has also been the language of caste oppression. It's been the language of caste discrimination. Uh, people have monopolized uh, the learning of Sanskrit and the education of Sanskrit. Okay, now it's being democratized. Good. But at the same time, uh, you have 22 official languages, you know. Uh, you have not only Hindi, you have Bengali, Marathi, Tamil, Malayalam, Odisha. You have so many classical languages which have as rich a history as Sanskrit, which have contributed to Sanskrit and have learned from Sanskrit as well. So I, it was in that context that I made a speech. I made that speech that really we should not be, you know, we shouldn't be harking back on a gold. This sone ki chidiya. Hum sone ki chidiya the. Or, you know, this argument that, you know, Lord Ganesha with his Vakratundam uh, shows that the ancient Indians knew the art of plastic surgery uh, or that, you know, uh, ancient Indians knew missile warfare and the fact that the word Vimana is there shows that, you know, before the Wright brothers, the ancient Indians had Indian I mean, what is this bunkum and this nonsense? Uh, you know, that uh, Newton and Einstein were nothing compared to our ancient scientists. So I think we must be proud of our traditions. We must be proud of our history. We must be proud of our cultures. But we cannot be blind uh, to, its, um, uh, to its faults. We cannot be blind to the fact that uh, this, uh, there was a monopoly on knowledge, uh, that uh, knowledge was not free, that not, people were not allowed full access uh, to knowledge and education. So this is part of our history. India has a glorious heritage, but it is also got a dark heritage. And we must take the positive with the negative and move forward rather than keeping on reinventing a glorious past. I mean, I don't think we should live in the past all the time. We should take pride in our past, but we should recognize that our past has had very many, very many uh, you know, weak spots, blind spots, uh, which have meant, and even today we see uh, the way we treat, um, you know, uh, the whole caste issue in India, the way we treat women in India, the way we are treating our migrant labor in India. What does it show? Because it shows a certain class character of our society. And that's what we have to really fight against. Are we again falling into the trap of the stereotypes, maybe? Uh, uh, but on the on the on how to counter the popular narrative, let me now move from this was on 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 the languages and and mythical stuff, but on more contemporary uh, uh, narrative, which another one, which is a classic example, I thought would be nice to you know get your views on, which you try to dispel, and it's etched in the popular contemporary history mindset of of the whole country is uh, Field Marshal Sam Manek shows anecdote that how he restrained Indira Gandhi, the then Prime Minister, from going headlong into the 1971 war and counseled her to, to delay it for its eventual victory. But um, in your uh, works, you've gone through detailed research and read papers which actually showed the other way around and how uh, uh, the, um, the popular narrative, how it played out, it was entirely his doing and uh, the, the leader being portrayed as a tad ne negative. Well, and you've gone through history and you've got that. But how well, can I you know, uh, uh, you know Phil Marshal Manek Shaw is an authentic Indian hero. Uh, I have a lot of regard for him. I've met him on one or two occasions. I know his daughter very well. Uh, he's, a, he's a fantastic human being, but he's a great storyteller because. And, and this was a bogus story that he spun. Uh, and the gullible Indian public bought the story that, you know, he wanted, uh, Indira Gandhi wanted to uh, rush in into Bangladesh, East Pakistan, and he held her back. No, the truth was just the opposite. Uh, you know, they were working a diplomatic strategy. They were working a political strategy. They were working a foreign policy strategy. Uh, and they wanted uh, to create enough of a domestic uh, support base in East Pakistan that would welcome Indian intervention. And finally, India intervened 
only on the 3rd of December 1971 when Pakistan attacked us. So, you know, it's, uh, there were people in India, Jay Prakash Narayan, for example, Atal Bihari Vajpayee, uh, there were many political leaders, even in the Congress party in 1971, who were advocating that we must have quick military action. We must have, to, view, to use today's language, we must have multiple surgical strikes right. you know, right away. <laughs> in 1971. But Indira Gandhi, you know, held back. Uh, and for nine months, she created a political uh, climate. Um, India absorbed 10 million refugees. And the entire world, uh, you know, supported India's stance. And finally, we had war in 1971. So you're right, you know, um, sometimes uh, popular narratives are quite different from actual reality. You know? and, and you've researched such a lot and also spent time with all of them. You know, the, the world has really seen a large scale narrative on migration of such kind only post Syria in the last you know, few years. But India actually saw it and saw it through very well back in the late 60s and early 70s with Bangladesh and, and 71 war was part of it. Uh, what is it for us? I mean, we still now want to go through with the world narrative, uh, but we fail to look at what we've already seen, experienced, suffered, come across and should have been an example to the world for that. I don't think enough is said about it because, because of internal political clashes. Yeah, I think the politics in India has become more toxic uh, in the last 25, 30 years. Uh, and I think political dialogue has broken down. Uh, even during Mr. Mrs. Gandhi's time, there were stalwart opposition leaders. Uh, but channels of communication were not broken. You know, they were both formal channels of communication and informal channels of communication. Uh, India was still a broadly open, pluralistic, uh, liberal democracy, barring uh, that period when emergency was, was imposed from June 1975 uh, to, uh, till March of 1977. Uh, uh, but the fact is that uh, in January of 1977, uh, Indira's, uh, Indira Gandhi announced elections. And in fact, in my book on Haksar, I said, Sanjay, Sanjay Gandhi's mother imposed the emergency, but Jawaharlal Nehru's daughter lifted the emergency. Uh, so, uh, but you know, in the last couple of years, unfortunately, politics has become very toxic. The discourse has become very toxic. Uh, and I, uh, I, I have to say this as a, as a student of Indian social history, Indian society has moved sharply towards the right. We are far less tolerant as a society. We, we, are, we always ask the question, why can't the others be like us? Instead of saying, uh, okay, others are like others and we are like us and how do we live together? Uh, uh, incidentally, because uh, let's take Kerala. Uh, Kerala if today is being held out all over the world uh, as an example of how uh, successfully uh, to combat, you know, the Corona crisis. Uh, but what is the great lesson we learn from Kerala? What, the greatest lesson we learn from Kerala is how people uh, live amidst diversity of an extraordinary variety. The community spirit, the, the spirit of openness, the spirit of giving, taking, sharing. These are the important values. And to me, if you ask me, this is the disturbing fault line in Indian society, growing intolerance of all types, you know, whether it's religion, whether it's language, whether it's caste, whether it's region, uh, whether it's class, uh, there's growing intolerance. And I think uh, the media reflects it. And unfortunately, the social media uh, puts, you know, the Mirch Masala uh, in this intolerance is coming from the social media, uh, which is not a force for understanding, but is actually becoming a force uh, for fostering misunderstanding. That's true. I mean, and you talk of uh, the, the current status of toxicity in the political thought. But as a political historian, when you peep into the future, there are again uh, paradoxical situations as a historian to look into the future. Does the world to you appear to be moving towards an Orwellian state, the, the 1984 of George Orwell, 
with the big brother syndrome, or you see a great hope of, of sunlight shining again on the liberal world, world order. Well, I think liberal values are under attack. Uh, you, will, you will have little pockets like New Zealand, uh, Germany, or even in our country, Kerala. But in general, because liberal values are under attack, they are under retreat. Technology, which should be an instrument of empowerment, is becoming an instrument of control. Technology, which should be an instrument of opening up systems, is becoming an instrument of surveillance. Uh, so I think uh, these are, uh, I, if you ask me whether I'm hopeful, well, you know, uh, there's an old saying, what is the difference between an optimist and a pessimist? Uh, a pessimist says, I cannot imagine a situation worse than today. And an optimist says, I can, you know. <laughs> so, uh, you're right, you know, sometimes one does get the feeling that the situation uh, is indeed uh, very dark. But, you know, I'm hopeful, as I said, there are, um, you know, in the, if you look at the world, you look at, you look at different countries, you look in our society itself, I've given you the example of Kerala. Uh, I've given you, there are other examples in our country where communities have come together in times of crisis. Uh, so it really, we must, we must really use this opportunity uh, for looking at inwards at our own fault lines. And we must realize the damage that we are doing to ourselves uh, by, you know, by this accentuating the divides that exist in our society. Uh, remember, uh, the motto of India is unity in diversity. In fact, I would say it's not unity in diversity. It's unity through diversity. Yes, that should be our motto: unity through diversity. If you are, if you maintain your diversity, if you respect your diversity, you are united. You know, unity is not uniformity because there's a difference between unity and uniformity. That is right. You and I are different in many ways. You speak a different language. You belong to a different community. Your background is different. Your religious faith is different. But we are united. You know. But we're not uniform, right? We're different. We're different people. You, I respect you and you respect me. So I, we might, I think, quickly come towards the closing. So before that, I want to pick your brains on two characters which you keep going back to in your, in your writings. And, and just on how you see people, because that's for me, that's the most important thing in, in, in a person is how he sees different people in. So I, I refer to two things. You've extensively written on Indira Gandhi, but let me pick one specific thing of her. It was uh, uh, on the environment side, you, you keep referring to her 1972, that watershed uh, conference in Stockholm, her speech there, and how she stressed on the importance of poverty alleviation as a necessary precursor to environment protection. And you call it the politics of poverty as well. And, and from that, uh, from the from the politics of poverty that was there to now, from the Rivi Hatao uh, slogan to Make in India slogan. Do you think the, po the, the politics of poverty is still relevant today? It is very much there or not? And how do you see Indira Gandhi with, as an environmentalist talking of poverty as a precursor? Well, first of all, let me say that, uh, you know, uh, I'm not obsessed with Indira Gandhi. I'm not, I mean, she's a very fascinating figure. Uh, if at all there is somebody who, whom I'm obsessed by in Indian political history, it's Nehru. I mean, he's my model uh, and he's the, pers he's the reason why I'm in the Congress party to begin with. Uh, and uh, all the things that I have done in my life uh, have, have really been based on my admiration, my, my respect, not uncritical. Uh, and at, at some point of time, I hope to write the definitive book uh, on, on Nehru, you know, at, in, over the next few years. And Indira Gandhi, to me, represents the continuation uh, of a certain Nehruvian philosophy. Now, on environment, because she was remarkable. In fact, she, uh, she went much ahead than Nehru. She was India's first and last prime minister to take environment seriously. Uh, 
all the environmental laws that we have today in it for forests, for trading pollution, uh, are because of her. She created the Ministry of Environment. And she, in one day, uh, you know, she said a very remarkable thing. She used to quote from our ancient uh, sayings. And she said, Prakriti Rakshati Rakshataha. In fact, if you go to the Ministry of Environment here, the new building in Delhi, you'll find this saying outside. Prakriti Rakshati Rakshataha. Nature protects those who protect it. Uh, I mean, very simple, you know. Uh, and she believed in it. She lived in it. Uh, and I think uh, the big challenge she faced, India is a poor country. India needs jobs. India needs industry. India needs factories. India needs to urbanize. But, but she has to protect her forests. She has to protect her wildlife. She has to protect her rivers. She has to protect our mountains. So I think uh, the reason why I wrote that book, Indira Gandhi, A Life in Nature, is to show how uh, we can grow, how we can develop, but yet protect the environment. You know, that's very important. Protecting so capacity needs to be always taken into account for. Absolutely. And, and you know, pro mm -hmm. environment today has become a public health issue. Uh, you're right. having tsunamis, you're having earthquakes, you're having floods. What does this mean? If you attack nature, nature will attack you. That's right. Prakriti, Rakshati, Rakshataha. If you protect nature, nature will. <clears throat> the other one that I wanted to, to, to talk on was, uh, uh, you refer to him several times in Making Sense of Chindia, which is Zeng He. I don't know how, if, if I pronounce it correctly, I'm not sure. The admiral who headed the Chinese fleet, which reached Malabar in the early 15th century. And some even claim that he might have reached America as well. What makes you find the character as enigmatic as that? And uh, why is he such a favorite of yours? Well, you know, uh, I've tried to understand Chinese history for a long time. I've been a student. I'm not a scholar of China, but I've been a student of Chinese history, Chinese economics, Chinese, you know, political history. Uh, A, because they are our neighbor. We have to understand, you know, how the Chinese think, how the Chinese act. Uh, and... Uh, you know, uh, it's a reality that we have to contend with. Uh, Chinese history has always fascinated me. I mean, the way, uh, because I, you know, in many ways, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not a Buddhist. I'm a student. You know, I think the greatest Indian that India has produced uh, is Buddha. Uh, and the way Buddha was taken uh, to China uh, became signified how the Chinese, he became Buddha with Chinese characteristics so to speak. These are all issues uh, that fascinate me. And Zhang He uh, was a Muslim. He was a, he was a eunuch. Uh, he was an admiral. He had seven voyages, uh, you know, in the early 15th century. He came to Calicut. Um, and uh, it's, uh, they, were, they were embassies being exchanged uh, between India and China in the, early 14th, in the early 15th century. I mean, this history... Uh, fascinates me. The interaction of these two great civilizations, these two great inward looking civilizations. Indian civilization also has been looking inward. Uh, Chinese civilization has also been an inward looking civilization. How these two great, two inward looking civilizations interacted with each other is something that fascinates me. Uh, you won not just dual but multiple hats. And, and the demands of the political hat that you wear must be immense in terms of time and energy that is consumed, and also the negativity that, that it sometimes generates, the way uh, politics is structured. However, does that affect Jairam Ramesh, the author, and constantly hides the author hat that you wear? And do you get the luxury of um, that most academics and authors demand in terms of time and focus? They need to sort of ruminate over and examine and refine their work and thought process. One thing that I've what never allowed, I've never allowed my politics to influence my writing. <clears throat> For example, many of my friends in the Congress party were very, very unhappy with some portions of my Indira Gandhi book because I was very critical <laughs> of her decisions uh, on the emergency, for example. Uh, some people in the Congress party have been very critical of my book, uh, the recent book on Krishnamanan. A checkered brilliance, because I've been very critical of Nehru, uh, particularly in the context of the 1962 war with China. Uh, 
Uh, see, for me, uh, because history is history. What is, what is the word for history in most Indian languages? In Hindi or Sanskrit or Marathi uh, or, you know, any other language, history is itihas, right? Itihas, what does itihas mean? Itihasa, this is what happened. Yes. Thus it was. So I follow, I don't write history, I write itihas. Thus it was. I look at facts. I look at primary archival material, whether it's Krishna Menon, whether it is Indira Gandhi, whether it's P.N. Haksa, whether it's Jawaharlal Nehru. I look at the written record. I look at what people write. I don't go by what people say. You know, India has been an oral culture for 3,000, 4,000 years. Absolutely. Uh, you know, and that has its strengths, but it also has its weaknesses. But I, for one, in my writings, I go by written archival records. Uh, and I don't allow my politics to influence my writing. I have my politics. I do my politics. Uh, but I do it in the way, uh, you know, there's an old Frank Sinatra. I think you're too young uh, to have heard Frank Sinatra, who was a, who was a voice of the 70s. Uh, Trust me, everybody thinks I was born old. So. <laughs> There's a very famous Frank Sinatra song, I did it my way, you know, yes. so, you know I did it my way, you know, sometimes I've, it's worked to my advantage, sometimes I've got thumped on the head, but that's part of life. But um, when you say you did it your way, was it, at, did at any juncture you reflect back and, and thought that I could have done it better or I should have done it the other way? <laughs> no, never look back, Vikas. Never look back. Move on. Uh, and, you know, if you start analyzing, if you start saying, I could have done this, I could have done that, you know, I wouldn't have. You know, I came back to India in 1980 uh, when it was not a fashionable to come back to India. I studied in America. I could easily have stayed back in America. I came back to India in 1980. People have asked me, do you want to go back? No, I never wanted to go back. Uh, you know, I never, I've never regretted that decision to come back. I joined the government. Did I regret joining government? No. Uh, I joined politics. Did I regret joining politics? No. I joined the Congress party. Did I regret joining the Congress party? No. Uh, have I made mistakes? Yes. And I've tried to learn from those mistakes, you know. So I think that the divorce from MIT was the biggest gain that that the Indian political <laughs> and yeah, I think we don't regret that uh, for a minute, uh, all of us, I'm sure. Um, also, uh, uh, when you talk of the written text, I think it's also all of us as lawyers and jurists are, are trained, you know, one of the most important facets of interpretation is contemporary expositor, you know, the best way of interpreting is seeing what the contemporaries of the, of the question thing thought of or wrote about. And it uh, reverberates with us uh, equally well. And, and uh, you know, on, that, on the note of, of, uh, of, of not having any regrets and, and doing things your way, let me also um, uh, speak in terms of, you know, Benjamin Cardozo, the great jurist, uh, uh, had, had written in one of, his, it's one of his quotes that, why, and I'm just reading his quote, why cannot I do as much, or at least something measurable as much, to bridge with my rules of law, the torrents of life. Very nice. So, so do you think you can say for yourself that your academic understanding and excellence, you've been able to bridge the torrents of governance and public life? Well, uh, if you were to ask me, what's the one thing because I should have done, which I didn't do. Uh, I didn't develop financial security for myself. Uh, I think to be successful in public life, uh, you have to be financially secure and independent. Uh, I'm still regretting the Nanda Nilkani's offer. <laughs> yes, well, I had a Nanda Nilkani offer, which I didn't take. Uh, <laughs> I, perhaps I regret now, but uh, I'm comfortable. I mean, I have nothing to complain about. However, I think if any youngster who comes to me and says, Sir, I want to join politics, a lot of people come to me and I said, Do you have an independent source of income? Do you have a steady source of income? Do you have another vocation? 
If the answer is yes to all these three, join politics. Otherwise, don't join politics. Don't be in public life. In public life, independence comes from financial security in many ways. In fact, it's, it's sounding uh, uh, so much familiar that uh, in legal jurisprudence and legal history, this is the traditional conservative thought, the traditional thought we always had for lawyers and judges as well, that uh, you're not here to earn your livelihood. You're here for a higher purpose. Absolutely. And only if you can do that, you'll, you'll justify it. So in that sense, it's, it's a, it's a, I can connect to that. But unfortunately, I believe it's become politically incorrect to say that in today's world. What do you, what do you say? That? You know, uh, it's all very well learning, Vikas, but some earning won't mind. You know, it's also important. <laughs> That's uh, true. And, and, you know, in today's, day and, uh, in today's day and age, very, particularly in politics, it's very important. Very. Many people I know have converted politics into a dhanda. Uh, they've used politics in, as a source of income, which I think is very, very wrong. Politics is about service. It's not about income. Uh, does this mean only rich people should come into politics? No. Uh, what it means is that you must have, you must have an independent, stable source of income. Whether in my case it comes from writing, uh, you know, it comes from a little bit of inheritance from my family, uh, but in a large part of it comes from writing. Uh, so it's important for today's youth to develop that alternative source. To make a situation themselves in public life. Uh, the voice, uh, yes, I think that. Um, uh, are we running out of time? Uh, can Apra uh, inform? Because I'm a lawyer and Mr. Ramesh is a politician. I think we can go endlessly. Yes, well, let's get some questions. If uh, the question, so there I was just checking with APRA if there are. Um, so before, I mean, uh, let me throw it open to the house. Um, and, and, and another form of introducing him is, you know, the robust voice of the opposition in Rajya Sabha today. <laughs> Mr. Ramesh is known by regions for his truly Nehruvian liberal scientific. Yes, liberal, Nehruvian, scientific, progressive, modern, humanistic approach. A man of unusual metal is a man of rare scholarship with us. So with that, can I invite uh, 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 questions uh, from people, if you can write on the chat box. Uh, I don't see. Uh... Mr. Balveer Singh, can you ask this? Yes, I'm waiting for the question. I can see the chat. All right. Oh, yes. yes. Hello. Yeah. Yeah, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, Dr. Balveer Singh, how this side? Good afternoon, sir. Right now, I am in on highway Dabas and there is slight uh, poor connectivity. Uh, really, it's a wonderful interaction, sir, with you, with a renowned economist and politician. I'm just curious to know how you entered in politics or how you see Jairam Ramesh as a politician first or writer first? Uh, well, I'm in politics, number one. Uh, is Politics is my full-time job. I get a salary because I'm in politics. Uh, but I'm also an author uh, and I'm not a 24 by 7 politician. Uh, I'm a politi politician who has other interests, uh, who uh, has cultivated, as I said, uh, the profession of writing, which also gives me an income. Uh, but yes, I, I, I'm a full-time politician as a member of parliament, as a former minister, as uh, an occasional spokesman for the Congress party. I'm very much uh, in, in political life. So uh, I, cannot, I cannot take that away from me, you know. Uh, do we have another question? Yeah. Yes, uh, I think this is a question by Akash from Akash, who's asking about liberal values. Yeah, you know, Akash, it's going to be very, very long haul. 
uh, you know, lib ultimately, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's society's values. We can't blame government A or government B. We can't blame party A or party B or C. Ultimately, it's society's values. Uh, you know, I look back, take Bollywood, for example. In the Bollywood that I was used to was progressive, moderately left-wing, uh, you know, still romantic about the role of the state uh, in India, tolerant of different opinions. But today's do Bollywood is uh, intensely hyper-nationalistic. Uh, today's Bollywood is, you know, macho, hum dikhayenge, karke dikhayenge. Uh, and there's a market for that. So society has moved. The balance in society has moved from the 50s uh, you know, to the 21st century, 1950s. If the balance was here, the balance has moved. The pendulum has swung to the other side. Uh, I think all societies go through this process. Uh, but we must find an equilibrium. Today is not the equilibrium. That is. Uh, I also have a question by Mr. Puneet. Just on that question, before Puneet goes in, Mr. Ramesh, when, when you're answering this question, do you think the equilibrium as Thomas Piketty has been has been talking of is it uh, a goal to be uh, to be aspired uh, and and that's the only saving uh, for the world, or we are moving in an infinite loop? No, I think that the point is that. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Piketty, you know so Piketty is right. Piketty, Piketty's point is e economic inequalities, uh, yes. you know, create the conditions for a retreat in liberal values. I, I, I entirely subscribe to that. And I think uh, in the last 25 years, for example, in India, we've had great success in dealing with poverty, but inequality has gone up. Right. Uh, India is a much... Uh, is a less poor society today, but is a more unequal society. And that creates the conditions for the growth of liberal value, illiberal values. But uh, paradoxically, because uh, in India, illiberalism has come from the middle classes. Illiberalism has not come from the poor, has not come from the migrant labor, has not come from the rural population. Illiberalism has come from the urban, educated, middle classes. And that is something for us to be really worried about. And that's a mystery. I think we'll need a full session one of these days. It's the yeah, big sure. mystery. Yeah, it's uh, really we need to go ahead with your question. Last question Mr. we can have from Mr. Mr. Ramesh. Uh, Mr. Ramesh, it's a pleasure seeing you here and talking to you uh, on this platform. First of all, I wanted to ask a different question, but I changed my question when I heard about Nehru. So I have a question about that. Yes, sir. I strongly believe, uh, you know, that whatever India is today, uh, one of the strong pillars is Nehruvian politics and his ideals about his vision about India. He's the reason we have democracy. He's the reason we have nuclear power. He's the reason we have great institutes. But it pains me when I talk to youngsters and many of them who have never read about him and they don't even understand him, rather... They curse him for, you know, all the wrong reasons, which are actually not true. What do you think went wrong in last 20, 30 years that today's youngsters don't understand Nehru, the great Nehru, I'll say? I agree with you and I share your sentiment. And this is really a matter of, uh, I think there's been an, this has been a continuous propaganda uh, from, certain sec uh, from certain sections of the political establishment. You know, Nehru has been under attack. You know, it's very interesting. Uh, I don't want to convert this into a political forum because I want to keep this non-political. But have you ever wondered, the RSS never attacks Indira Gandhi. The RSS attacks only Nehru. Yes. Uh, you know, and I've tried to answer to myself, why is it uh, that uh, the, uh, Mr. Modi attacks in the, uh, Nehru all the time? He never attacks Indira Gandhi. Never. He attacks um, uh, only Nehru. Mirror uh, reflection, maybe? And, uh, and the reason for that, you know, uh, I think they're complicated, but one reason is, yes, I Muslim man ko dikha diya. Pakistan ka batwara kar diya. And, you know, that's, uh, that's one way of looking at it. But I think, uh, remember, India is a 
democratic republic today because of gandhi because of nehru because of patel because of ambedkar and because of our constitution there was an alternative vision of india then and that was hindu india as a hindu rashtra india as a hindi rashtra hindu hindi no this was there was a very important school of thought at that time and there were many people in the congress party who believed uh, in the 1940s and 50s they believed in the hindu hindi type of an equation but patel nehru and gandhi won over them uh, but over the years you know unfortunately you know the majoritarian sentiment in india uh, has become uh, you know far less liberal than what it used to be india india was secular in the 1950s because hinduism was a broad minded uh, philosophy the people who wrote the constitution were largely hindus were largely middle class educated hindus that's right and they decided the hindus decided that india will not be a hindu rashtra but a secular state in which all religions will be respected however in the last many years for a number of reasons uh, we don't have time to get into it now uh, this the nature of the hindu thought has changed and if hindus in india are not going to be liberal india will not be liberal that's true simple as that very simple as that so before we part and i hand it over to shelja maybe i just request you in fact that was the first request it came on chat box that you are a master storyteller so can you please as a parting thing leave us with a smile with an anecdote from recent experiences let us all uh, let us all uh, uh, leave with a smile on our faces well i don't i'm not a master storyteller if it is 700 pages but i'm not a master storyteller when it comes uh, to 30 no, no, seconds less than field marshal sam manekshwat storytelling <laughs> <laughs> i can no, assert that i'm not a, i'm not that type of a storyteller of the field yeah. manekshwat type i you know i deal with yes uh, with political stories with historical stories but let me say that you know i'm i'm delighted uh, to have this conversation Uh, you know this is a, a new form of communication that all of us have developed uh, because of the crisis that we are facing i hope that we get out of the crisis uh, and i really I, i really you know the one thing that bothers me about what has happened in the last two months uh, is the manner in which uh, the indian state uh, has dealt with the whole issue of migrant labor uh, uh, and we are still groping to way of that and i think that's to me uh, the most worrisome part and i hope that we will spend a little more time on that shelja ji over to you so with that we come to the end of this wonderful session thank you so much mr thank you and look forward to more such sessions for being with us today but It face has- but face to face not on zoom <laughs> it has been an absolute pleasure listening to you thank you amazingly engaging session which kept us glued to the screen thank and you guys thank, thank you sir thank you so much dr balia you were impressively well prepared with your insightful and pertinent questions and uh, we enjoyed the outcome and he's got some wonderful paintings behind him <laughs> thank you <laughs> A big thank you to all our viewers for joining us for this session, and also to our wonderful Prabha Ketan Foundation team for toiling tirelessly behind the scenes to bring these sessions to us. Thank you, everyone, once again. <laughs>